Hey, folks, my guest today is Tom Burnside. He is leading LendingPoint.com, an AI-driven credit tech lending platform. He sees the company as a way to do well and do good simultaneously by protecting, nourishing, and growing each consumer's financial future. He does this with over 25 years of experience and a wealth of industry knowledge uh, prior to LendingPoint. He's an accomplished credit and financial services leader and trusted data scientist. Tom leads the rest of the team in serving their borrowers, their originating financial institutions, their merchants, and other service providers while delivering predictable returns to their capital market providers. Tom, you ready to take us to the top? We are. All right. So what gave you this idea? I think back in 20, was it 2013, the start date? Well, it was 2014. The end of 2014, really started funding in 2015. Um, yeah. What gave us an opportunity is what we were looking at was at a marketplace that was serving uh, some of the credit bands well, uh, really kind of the, th- the assets that other banks and otherwise would buy. Uh, What we saw was an opportunity for kind of the more challenged credits to start there, understand that, do it really well through AI, and then continue to broaden our funnel. Uh, And so today, you know, today we fund all, you know, all credit bands from, you know, from 550 all the way up to 850. Uh, But we started in that really that 660 and under space just so we could try to understand them, give them a reasonable price and and a reasonable product and tell their story in a way that nobody else was telling it. So these are folks, if you're listening and you're doing 50,000 a year in annual revenue and you want to take out a, what, a $5,000 loan, Tom, something like that, they can check out your offer. Yeah. Five to, you know, 5,000. Now that that market goes all the way up to 50,000. So as we got better on the marketing and the better on the understanding of the customer, we've been able to expand the offers. What, what did you, sorry, what did you start with though? What was your initial sort of target offer size in 2014? It was about 5,000. It was about 5,000. Very beginning start at 5,000. So that was your sort of thesis. And then it scaled from there. I guess, take me take me back to one of those early deals. So I'm a consumer. I have a great, you said a credit score above what? So like, typically the, in the early days, that credit score would be around 620, 625, maybe in that area. Okay. Uh, and and so then what might the offer was, look like? Well, it was either somebody that was lightly, you know, had light credit footprint, right? They were just getting established and nobody could really kind of put all the other kind of API and data information together to be able to tell their story. So there's a lot of other things that you would look at if outside of just credit. You might look at phone bills, you might look at rent history, you might look at some other things to tell the story of their willingness to pay, right? Or their ability to pay. And so those are the things we, you know, we really focused on. We focused on, I mean, one of the problems you always have is fraud. And we focused a lot on KYC, know your customer. Uh, and we were able to get a very predictive outcome on those predictor scores. So, you know, this was typically somebody that was either on the way back up, you know, had gone through a dip or just had a very light credit footprint. And today, even back then in your pro forma is when you're, you know, building in sort of a charge off or a losses or bad debt expense, is this 2%, 3%, 4%? What do you build in as a buffer? Well, you know, really what you're doing is the AI models have done an amazing job of predicting risk. Uh, and so, you know, what, so the way that the AI models work today is it predicts risk, puts you in a category, uh, and then tells me, okay, basically, here's what the risk is going to be. But then pricing is the next kind of uh, uh, optimization tool that we use. And we have about five different buckets of credit grades or risk, right? And we, but we now are up to 400 different pricing points within inside of those grids. So we are getting really, really good at giving you the right product at the right time, at the right place with the right terms and conditions that you can understand how affordable it is for you to you know, finish a project or, or to, to, you know, to resolve some consolidation of bills or whatever it is that you need to do. Oh, what's going on there, YouTube? Good to see you guys. Now imagine this. You love watching these interviews with SaaS founders, but imagine if we took all of the valuation data out from over 2,807 interviews I've done manually. Saves you a lot of time. Well, we've done this. We've built it into the beautiful interface inside of FounderPath. Check this out. I'll show you how you can access this in a second, but you log in, you connect your Stripe account, you see your valuation real time, you can see what it changed over the past 88 days, and even set goals for valuation this year. Now, the secret valuation is there's many different ways to value a SaaS business. So the reason you're going to see three or four different valuations inside of your FounderPath dashboard, this is all free, by the way, is because depending on who's doing the buying of your SaaS company, you're going to get a different valuation. A VC is going to pay a different valuation. Private equity firm is different. If you're going to do a minority sale, that's different. And if you sell the whole business, that's a different valuation. You can see all those when I hover over here. 
right? So the teal is what a VC would pay. Yellow is what private equity and red is if you sold the whole thing outright. Now, what's cool about this is this is not built off random data. Again, you guys hear these interviews on YouTube. All these data are built from real time valuation data points founder share with us on the show. So traction 1.2 million seed round 3.7 raise. They sold 22% of their business. Go in here and filter by the event. Maybe you only want to see companies that have sold the whole business. Well, here are a bunch that have been acquired, the valuation and the multiple. Maybe you're going out right now and you're raising your seed round. Well, go in here and look at all this recent seed deals that went down, what they raised, what valuation they raised at, and what percent that they sold. There's never been a larger data set of SaaS valuations than what you can get now inside of FounderPath, and we're thrilled to bring it to you. All right, we're gonna go back to the YouTube video here in a second, but if you wanna check this tool out, if you wanna jump in and sign up, you can check it out for free to get your valuation at this link, this link, founderpath.com forward slash products forward slash valuations, or if you go to founderpath.com and hover over products, click on get your valuation here, and go ahead and sign up to give it a whirl. Again, all that valuation data live right inside the platform. I hope to see you there. All right, let's jump back into the interview. So let's go stay in 2014 before because you've had a lot of growth. Let's stay in 2014 though for another minute or two. I take, I, I'm one of your first customers. I have a 650 score 700. I go ahead and take 5K. What am I going to pay you back over what term uh, total? So is it 5,500 over six months or what's the term look like? Yeah, typically the average price back in the back in those days was about mm, 22, 23% uh, uh, you know, uh, weighted average uh, coupon, if you think about it in that particular way. Um, and it was typically over three to four years is what we were doing. Uh, well, that's a back, long you know, payback period. Early. That's a long time to pay back. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Even back then, the models were doing a really good job of predicting something. Typically what happens in this, this is why we saw the opportunity in this particular area you saw a lot of very, very short transactions, six, yeah. eight, 12 months. And we saw an opportunity to give somebody something that was very affordable. And so we didn't want to go below 24 months and we were able to get those out as long as 48 months, even back in the day, by telling, by, by taking the AI information and doing a better job of telling the story and therefore giving them something that was affordable. Because one of the problems is if you're paying back $5,000 over 12 months, it's a very expensive payment. When you start to elongate that out, it becomes very affordable and you give them the opportunity to get back on their feet and be able to pay back. And now, you know, most of those customers have come back to renew uh, with us or come back to take another loan with us. You know, we now have about 30 percent of the base is, is in a renewal status with us because we made it affordable. They were able to pay it back and they're able to take more money. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear, if I take that 5K from you in 2014, and I pay it back over three to four years. My total interest on that 5K over four years is twelve hundred. Right, that's twenty three percent ish, or is it twenty three percent per year? No, that's roughly. That's roughly about twenty three over that period of time. I see. I see. Interesting. So was, okay. Yeah. So it wasn't based on typically what you see in this market is a is a discount rate, or you would see a percentage. That's not what we did. We actually use a, a, an interest rate, and if we were charging twenty three percent, it's twenty three percent a year based on the outstanding balance, which averages out to about twenty, you know, twenty three. To thirty percent over the life of the of the of three years. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. So, I mean, can, I mean, can we basically say that that's effectively an eight percent APR or interest rate? Um, no, you would want to think about it as an interest rate as a twenty. Yeah, it's a twenty three percent interest rate, right? So, yeah, it's not really a discount. It's it's just a simple interest rate, like you pay for a car or a house or you know anything else that you do. If you take some of these discount rates, uh, you know, they could be upwards over one hundred percent interest. And so we think that we're given the best deals in the marketplace, uh, hands down. Yeah, we're and I would I would agree with that based off comps. I know, but talking about the pure interest rate makes you seem really bad uh, be, because it makes anyone seem bad because the numbers are scary. But because you give people such a long, like I get, I totally get this. You give people a long time to pay back. It, it it makes it sound a little bit better. But the reason I'm asking these questions is you were able to secure to lend. You have to secure money to lend, right? right. You secured 100 million basically on day one. So I, I believe. So how did you do yes. that? Well, look, I mean, some of this was based on track record. So we were able to get better pricing on the facilities uh, that we that we borrow from for ourselves to be able to make that money available to our customer. So we were able to get uh, you know some pretty good rates back in the day. That rates of, those rates have come down a lot, right, over the last few Wait, years. Tom, come on. What was that. what was what was good back in the day? What was good back in the day? We we start off at around a ten percent cost of funds on our own. That's not right. a lot of, were there warrants involved? 
there was a, there was a few warrants in there. Like we, I think we gave up uh, one percent in the first year to get a, to get some of the good deals. That's that's not uh, bad. Not too bad. Not too bad. We didn't feel too bad about it. But the the good news, the customer is able to get you know because we were able to save money, we were able to push that forward to the customer. No, that's great. I mean, th- that's exactly why you want to be able to negotiate. Obviously, that low cost capital. Now, was your credit box really tight? Right? Did they really restrict you what states you could lend to scores above you know six fifty or above, or did you have enough flexibility to actually deploy that capital? Yeah, we had enough uh, flexibility. I mean, obviously, being in this market for quite a while, what we did is we did it. We really used more of our own equity, uh, so we, our advance rates were a little bit lower, so our box was wider, so we could test more. Uh, so we were able to go right at the market and test it in the best of ways. Uh, we did most of it our own balance sheet to start with, just so we could prove the concept and the model worked. So Tom, just be clear, uh, you raised equity on day one and you were using that capital to test? To test the market. That's How right. much on day one? Do you remember? Well, yeah. So the, the, what's interesting, the group of team, uh, the team we have here raised about $220 million of friends and family. Uh, just really no outside rounds, but uh, friends and family, we raised that over, you know, over about probably four or five different tranches that we re-raised it. But we didn't really consider them A rounds, B rounds. It was our friends and family coming to the table uh, we had other deals that we had done together that worked out well. And so it was relatively easy to raise that. Uh, our first institutional raise didn't actually happen until 2020. Well, that's uh, why I'm asking. So that two, to that 220, like that capital you started your balance sheet on day one, was that like a prom note on the operating company or was it actual equity that your friends and family, they put money in for equity in the business? A little combination of both. Some of, some of it was just pure equity. Some of it was uh, you know more mezzanine type structure. Right, so a little combination of both, but it allowed us to use that money to leverage to be able to get us, uh, you know, access to capital, uh, be able to 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 test our models and and uh, you know make sure that our models were as predictive as we were hoping they were going to be, and they they you know they became that uh, over a short period of time, and therefore then the cost of capital continues to go down as your you know as your performance of the models are better. It's magic that way, right? There's a lot of fintech entrepreneurs listening to this interview, and they're all wondering how much loan tape and vintage history do they have to build to drive their costs from 12% and 1% warrants down to you know 8% or bringing a bank on top of the credit fund or whatever to drive the blended down. What did you back then have to grow your loan tape to to get significant savings below that 10% cost to capital on your first $100 million? You know, I, that's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple of things. The weighted average life of an asset even though you write it for 24 or 36 months, you know, people end up paying it off in 18 months or they pay it off in 16 months. So, you know, you, you know, within about a year, a uh, year and a half, you have a pretty good idea of how the, how the curves are going to work uh, because most of your losses are really front ended. In the first six months, you'll see about 60% of your losses on a vintage analysis curve. So it's relatively easy. Once you get past six months, they can kind of predict the rest of your curve. And, and so a year into it, you've got a couple of turns of products. Um, but you know, it really wasn't until we got over, call it a hundred million dollars of, of of transactions until they were said, look, you got enough scale, enough predictability, and a couple of turns of the product that we feel comfortable in giving you better, you know, better pricing and better advance rates. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, this makes sense. And let me a couple of things I want to pull out here because it's great for consumers listening. First off, you don't charge prepayment penalties, which is great, right? You let people pay off early if they want. That's right. Yep. It's a very flexible capital product. That's that's fantastic. No hidden fees. Um, talk to me about scale that first year. So just total amount of loans done in 2014. Do you remember? Yeah, it was about $15 million. Uh, it wasn't a lot. Uh, it, it wasn't a lot. But it and felt it's... like a lot back then though. It sure did. Uh, <laughs> and we learned a lot. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, I mean, we can sort of calculate, right? If you had 15 out, you gave us 23% minus 10%. That's 100. What is that? 30, you know, 13 points of spread, right? That's nice. It's a good business. So you go, okay, we're on to something. What's next? Well, then you have these little things called losses, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you have the cost of capital, but you also have losses, your second largest component. Uh, so it was a little, it was a lean year, uh, you know, but it was a great year of learning, a great year of kind of understanding how their credit models were going to perform and, you know, and what we needed to augment them to, you know, to get the losses in line with where we were hoping them to be. I love this. Okay. So that's a great, this guys, this is year one. You just heard it year one. Now let's yeah. go fast forward, Tom, 2018. How much, how much total capital raised over the prior four, or sorry, lent over the prior four years? So, I mean, we got, uh, you know, what's interesting about it is we hit about 360 or so, uh, you know, so things were starting to grow. The, the 360 the, uh, million in loans in 2018. Yeah. The capacity is starting to grow now. You know, we're, we're starting to get in a great place. 
Um, uh, the models are performing well. We have a couple different lines of credit now at this point. All of them have been upsized, you know, so now we have access to, you know, roughly, I think at that particular point, about 350 to $400 million of capacity uh, at that particular point in time. So life is getting better. Cost of funds are coming down by a couple of points. So those spreads are widening, uh, which is always good. It helps pay bills. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we're talking like you get down to 7% in 2018, 6%, something like that. Uh, it was about 8%. It was about 8% okay. at that point. Right. Okay. I mean, it wasn't until you really cross over a half a billion dollars of originations a year until pricing really starts to come of real scale. When did you hit that? Uh, we hit that in 2019. Okay. 20, uh, and that, that's half a billion yeah, in new originations. Crossover. Yes. Wow. Okay. That's fantastic. I mean, one of the problems a lot of folks have when they do these deals is they think they want to go raise a big warehouse facility. The problem is you end up with unused fees if you can't attract customers and deploy it quickly. It sounds like you just told me in 2018, you had 400 million in capacity, but you did 360 million. That's very good optimization in terms of actually utilizing what you what you took down on the facility size. How did you plan that so, so well? Well, you know... Uh... The, the nice thing about growth is, is um, you know, our models have really led, our AI models from a marketing perspective have really led who we go after and how big that TAM is or that total addressable market. So we knew basically based on our efforts, what we needed to do to grow the next 10 million, the next $20 million a month, right? And so what you're really trying now to do is line up capital, right? The capital that you need to, you know, to, to backstop that advance rate right? and grow and continue to grow the business. And so, you know, that was all kind of coming together at that particular point. Uh, and really limiting factor was capital. It's just how much capital do you have on the books? Uh, that was really more of your limiting factor, uh, more so than the capacity of the lines. Yeah, very cool. And then fast forward to date, obviously we're in the middle of 2022, but what was 2021 total loans, new loans done that year? Uh, 20, uh, 2021, I mean, it was, a, it was a very interesting year. We grew 144% year over year, 20 to 21. What number uh, in capital deployed? So, yeah, I, I'm sorry. What number grew by that amount? The capital deployed uh, or the revenue? The 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 uh, the funding levels. The funding levels. And we'll talk about revenue here in just a second. But the funding levels themselves. So we grew. We went from roughly um, about uh, you know we we went to uh, to 2.1 billion in 21, uh, which is a you know a huge uh, you know a huge growth. But we slowed down a little bit during COVID in 2020. Uh, but then we had, you know, just significant, so it closed a little under a billion, then went to 2.1 billion. So we had significant growth kind of year over year. You know, this year we're already starting out about 800 and about almost $900 million. Just You've already sport. done 900 million in Q1. Yes. Incredible. So we're, we're, yeah, it's, it's, it's growing quickly now. That's incredible. Okay. I didn't bring it up, but you did talk to me about revenue. So, you know, from a, from a revenue perspective, I think there's probably two pieces uh, here in 2021, we were at about 330 million. Mm-hmm. That's a run rate, uh, yeah. and that, and that's and that's net, net interest margin, or is that before you pay out your your cost of capital? This is basically this is our this is our net revenue, right? After you pay back your warehouse providers, all that. That's right. Wow, um, 350. You said 330. 330. Uh, so okay. approximately 330, and we'll be around 600 million this year. That's incredible. Um, when was your first million dollar year? Do you remember? Was that 2015? Uh, yeah, it was 2015. Yeah, you got there pretty quick because I'm doing the spread on 15 million out, right? With with 13 points of spread, you get there quick. Yeah. Interesting. Um, most most businesses like this have trouble scaling because for, for two reasons. They have to fight yield compression, right? Because more money will plow into the market, right? If it's a known known asset class, right? The second is your Google ad expense goes up, right? You have to have CAC arbitrage somehow. So how have you fought both of these, you know, headwinds on both sides to keep scaling so fast? Well, look, I think the question has always been in the fintech space. Uh, is it scalable? Is it predictive? Right. And is it sustainable? Can you grow it? Can you continue to grow it at the, at the appropriate rates? And, and I think we've answered those questions. Uh, you know, I think, you know, first of all, uh, the biggest challenge you have is you have to be able to optimize your cost to acquire a customer. And that really comes through your ability to renew a customer. I mean, we have an 86 net promoter score. We work really hard on our customer uh, to make sure that our customer is is having a great experience because if they have a great experience, they come back, they see you as kind of that trusted advisor. So I mean, right now, uh, about 25 to 30% of our base runs in renewals, just renewals alone. These are customers just coming back. And how many, by the way? So right now, if you look at your loan tape, how many customers have at least a dollar out with you? Uh, We're a little over 300, right, right at 300. 
okay. uh, thousand customers. Yeah. And we've serviced about 450 in total. Wow. So that's a very high renewal rate, actually, right? I'd expect that number to be way higher if people weren't coming back, but it's actually not a big number of people. That's right. Uh, and the average transaction today is about 11,000, right? So it's moved from the 5,000 days uh, to about 11,000 today. And you still like it's still sort of three to f- the average deal, three to four year payback, 23% ish? Well, we bought a point of sale company. And so things moved, changed a little bit when we bought the point of sale. Uh, when we bought the point of sale company, uh, we were able to move to seven and 10 year paper for home improvement. So we're in the home improvement space and point of sale as well as medical. Uh, and in those spaces, you know, you tend to go a little longer in turn. On a direct to consumer type of product, it's typically still around five years. Um, uh, is you know, to the typical duration. Mm-hmm. So this is really interesting. I talked to a lot of SaaS founders that have built like a really interesting marketplace that that maybe connects. Um, I'm going to make this up. Uh, a lumber provider of two by fours with construction workers, and there's massive there's a massive audience on both sides and they sit in the middle and what they're doing now is sort of factoring the paper, right. On 30 day things. You, if correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you effectively understand the, the, you know, how exciting this is. You might go buy that thing and you already know the finance side of the business. So you'll sit in the middle and just start doing that. And then in the, in the construction space. That's right. That's right. And, yeah. I mean, for an example, if you look at our e-commerce space, I mean, we're, we're setting, uh, you know, we're setting there to, to help the small business uh, or the e-commerce uh, business, we're helping them uh, buy inventory so they can de- re- they can deploy. So, you know, they run a sale, they run low on inventory, they use us as a backstop to be able to fill back up the inventory. Mm-hmm. So I we just said on I'm the so consumer impressed. side as well as small business. I'm just impressed you've been able to do this because there are competitors that only do one of these things that you're dealing with. So like BILLD.com does this in vendor management and construction, obviously Paylocity and ClearCo in the e-commerce space, like all the areas you just mentioned, there are billion dollar competitors. So how are you winning? How, how are you going into these markets and sort of building a better mousetrap? Um, look, we have an amazing team. We really do. I mean, the, the team has been around this uh, around the space for a very long time. We also have great connections into the financial markets, so we've been able to to get the lines of credit, the things we need to do in order to be able to provide uh, the service. We also, you know, we we operate. You know, our platform today services banks and credit unions, and uh, you know, uh, ABS's forward flows as well as our own balance sheet. So, you know, we have a lot of optionality for our customer, and, and we continue to grow the optionality to be able to make sure that we can aggressively price, that we can give them the right product at the right time with the right amount of money you know, to, to fulfill whatever it is that they're trying to do at that point. Mm-hmm. I have a bunch of other questions on how you securitize and all that, but unfortunately we're running low on time. So I'll just simplify the question. How much debt capacity do you have right now? You're doing 900 million a quarter. How much could you lend? Um, you know, we, we, we can easily get to a billion, two, billion, five with what we have right now. It's a combination of warehouses, ABSs, forward flows, you know, bank commitments, things of that sort that make that happen. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we, we know we can get to at least a billion five. And the question really is in this market, you know, we, we, uh, we're seeing some pullback from some of our competitors. And I think, you know, it's an opportunity. We have the right kind of, uh, product and the performance and portfolio. I think we're going to continue to take advantage of the marketplace where it's at. And, and what you know better than anybody, what are these kinds of companies getting valued at today? Is it a multiple, like, let's look at 2021. Is it a multiple on your 330 or do you get a multiple, you know, lower multiple on loans done 2.1 billion? You know, it's a challenge. This is the challenge for, for, uh, uh, for valuation, right? The challenge valuation is a very fast growing company earnings lag. So, so typically these are discounted cash flow models and are really looking more at uh, a multiple of revenue. Uh, typically, and a lot of times it's either forward or, or you know post, but a, a lot of times they're they're looking forward now because on a really fast growing uh, revenue company, they'd probably look more like in our case the six hundred million dollars than they would look at the three thirty. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know what I'm saying? So, but the that is a valuation challenge because a fast growing company will continue to have massive scale and efficiencies of scale and growth and revenue that won't show up in earnings in the first year. So you really kind of need to do it more as a discounted cash flow we see primarily over a five-year period or even a 10-year period uh, to pick up the value of the of what you're creating. So if you did this analysis last year, what was what did you value the business at if you're on a DCF model on it? I mean, it's got to be in the billion. I mean, definitely in the billions, right? You pass 5 billion? So we're, we're, I'm, I'm going to hold that. Uh, at this particular point, uh, we're, guys, I got so much. The flow was so good. We're smiling, <laughs> we're laughing, and then I hit him with valuation, and he shut. He shuts down. Yeah, well, you know, here's the deal. We're making money. Uh, we'll we'll make a hundred plus this year. Um, hundred million net. 
Yeah, uh, 100, 120. Yeah. Um, uh, and we're one of the only ones that are growing at the rate we're growing and making that level of profit. Uh, so, you know, we, um, we're going to let the markets decide that at some point. Uh, but, uh, you know, we feel like we're in a really great spot. We feel like, uh, you know, the things are moving in the right direction. The predictability of the models continue to get better. The AI is growing fast on both the, you know, both the credit, but also on the, on the, on the pricing of the products. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's really accelerated our growth and we're, we're pretty excited about where we're at. Let me just put this the 125 Warburg put in more or less than 5% of the business. (laughs) Uh, yeah, it was, you know, Warburg is an amazing partner. Uh, <laughs> this guy's a great politician over here. This is great. <laughs> they, 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 they had, look, I, Warburg, that was the first institutional round that we've taken. Yeah. Uh, and they've been amazing partners. Like they, they, they have been really, really good. Um, you know, um, I think we do well as a company, so that helps the relationship. They were but, debt uh, first, they, I imagine. Right. Were they one of your debt partners early on? No. Oh, they weren't. Oh wow! No, okay. no, no. They didn't come in until two thousand. They came in during COVID. So huh. even during COVID, the models had uh, really, really, really held. Uh, the beta risk was still low, uh, and they followed us for about six months and then jumped in. Um, and so, yeah, great, great partners. Uh, you know, they put in a uh, one hundred seventy-five million dollars now themselves uh, into the company. So, uh, you know, how much we're, was we're secondary? Uh, none. No, I thought you were going to say all of. I thought all of it would be secondary. With you printing out hundred million in free cash flow, why wouldn't it all be secondary? Well, remember we're, we continue to pour that money back into the business right now to continue to grow it. You mm-hmm. know, at the pace we're growing, you know, you need to feed the the proverbial beast, right? So that money keeps going back into the organization, and we have taken no secondary. Uh, we have poured all the money back into the company to keep the company grow. Well, Tom, okay, last question here as we wrap up. How do you keep early employees excited about an eventual payday? You're not public. There's no secondary options. They've been with you since 2014. You maybe use options to recruit them. When are they going to see money? Um, we're going to let the market, when the market's ready, we'll be ready. Uh, uh, we, you know, look, the, uh, we have an amazing team of people. Uh, a lot of these people have worked with me at least two to three other companies. Um, and, and uh, you know, they, they believe in kind of the overall dream and where we're going. And I, uh, our success is put squarely on their shoulders. When did you hire your last CFO, your current one that's with you? When did you hire him or her? Uh, 2019. Interesting. All right, guys, I expect an S1 filing in Q3 this year. You heard it here first. Tom, let's wrap up with... <laughs> let's wrap up with... <laughs> I'm going to get him in trouble. Yeah. Tom, let's wrap up here with the Famous Five. These are easy. Number one, favorite business book? Um. Uh, you know, uh, my, mine is, mine is, uh, uh, I'm a Jim Collins fan, right? Uh, and so anything really that Jim Collins writes, I'm a big fan of, uh, good to great is probably my favorite. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think uh, Jamie Dimon has got to be the guy, right? He's, uh, he's been very, very much on top of his game. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building lending point? Oh boy, then I, I I don't know that I can answer that question. I'm going to offend somebody. All right, we'll skip that one. Uh, we'll skip that one. Stay, stay neutral. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Uh, about six. And situation, married, single kids? Married and uh, uh, married and two daughters. Two kiddos. And how old are you, Jim? Or Tom, sorry. Uh, uh, young. I'm uh, uh, 58. 58. Last question. Take us back to your 20-year-old self. What's something you wish you knew? It, it was all going to work out. Keep going. <laughs> Guys, there you have, there's a lot of flash in the pan startups raising a billion dollar valuations right now that have lent a total of like, you know, 15 million or something. It's crazy. Then you look at this story. It's unbelievable. Back in 2014, it said, you know what? We have an opportunity here to do good and do well at the same time. 15 million loans done, average loan side of 5,000 bucks to consumers with a 620 credit score or above. They made money that first year by raising capital at about 10%, lending it at about 23%. You make a spread. Fast forward to 2018, 400 million capacity, 360 lent out, same economics, a little lower cost of capital. But now today, incredible growth. They're, they have about 11,000 as their average loan size. 600 million is the revenue they'll do this year with about 120 profit. 30% of new customers are repeat, 300,000 customers to date as they continue to scale with very little outside capital. Thanks for so much, Tom, for taking us to the top. Appreciate the time. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. 
One founder comes on, three hungry buyers, they try and do a deal live and the founder shares backend dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at nathanlacka.com forward slash Slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right, I'll be in the comments. See ya.